of 60 odd years. If you look at the, if you look at any of the old books, that, that was down for joining the, uh, the BS in 1955. Mm -hmm. He'll turn around to him and said, I actually joined in September 1954. But the then secretary, Mr. Sentinel, said, I'll hold your membership over so you get a full year. Dad always said he'd give me out of the year's free membership when I'd done 40 years. <laughs> From my point of view, my, I have two early recollections. I can remember Michael being born at home, and I can remember. What was my playpen? It wasn't one of these things that they put in front of the fire. My playpen was at the top of the garden, and they used to put me in the flight to play in the sand and gravel in the outside flight. And I always turned around to Dad and said, you had me cleaning cages before I could walk. <laughs> so that's how long we've been in the hobby. That is the main over it. That's why I that it was originally Dan Tabery. It's changed over the years. It's it, you know it's nothing recognisable. But that's the that's the main library that Michael runs. No outside flights. Um, the two bits at the front, where the horizontal windows are, those were the outside flights. Uh, our birds used to go outside in the snow, like little kids. But other than that, they never went outside. So we made the decision that we got this big piece of real estate that was never ever bloody used, so we would put it inside. I will just add at that point, it's not two storeys either. No. The roll no. windows across the top is where I lifted the flat roof up to get that roll of windows in, just to get light, natural light, into the breathing. back of the, the main mm. breathing area. Because the one on the left, I'll go on, just look back at it. The one on the left is the new, smaller reading room. When I say new, it's, it's the old wooden shed that's been revamped <coughs> just during the COVID period. Dad always used to call that the sales shed. That, that was all the, the sales that, All the sales were in, but there was nine stock cages and, and a flight. Now there's 30 breeding cages. You'll see them here, there's 30 breeding cages in there. It hadn't been used in years. It had become the junk shed. shed. Um, and I'm going to tell you more in a second. That's the main breeding room. Yeah. The, That's what people want in one end way. to the other. Uh, we used 35 breeding cages in there. This end of the aviary was where I used to, used to have zebra finches because when Michael and I asked the birds the one year, Dad was adamant he didn't want us to have budgies. You can have anything you want, but don't have budgies because you'll never get the credit for what you do because of me. I had zebra finches, and this end, what is that? The, if you look at the, uh, the photo on the left, the far end was my ovary, and it's fitted out for zebra finches. Uh, but at that, at that stage, that was all divided. Yeah, that was all divided. There was three, there was three sheds. Uh, side, side by side, since then we've taken all the dividers out. And these are the, the seat. That there is the remains of the roof, the old roof shot. Yeah. Um, and and while, we're, while we're at this point, the, the fact that, that we evolve every year is last year was the introduction of the, uh, ventilation. the ventilation system. And we see them uh, redug up, he, he, he sorted all the parts out with. The amount of birds that we keep, dust is a major problem. So we needed to upgrade the, the ventilation system. So we put a piped ventilation system in with a uh, sizable extract unit in one in. How many dust have you there? It's nine <coughs> inch. My memory is right. Six, nine, six inch? Six inch. Six inch dust. Six inch dust. No, the the ivory, the, the ivory, the shed, sorry. Yeah. The footprint of the ivory is roughly 30 foot by 30 foot, plus the new place. The lights now have been converted to LEDs, um, trying to keep the cost of things down, uh, the electricity being as it is. The heating 
is only ever used in breeding cages, in the breeding rooms where that where that's shown there. If we go on to the fly pit. But say that when when Dad said we couldn't he didn't want to start budgets, Michael insisted that he wanted budgets. So Dad said said to him, You've got to have a variety that I've never had in the aviary. That left clear wings and red eyes. So Michael started with Lutinos, out of the Lutinos came the Albino. So Michael's stud, Michael's original stud, is the red eyes that, that, that we've got. Dad's were the normals and, and the, um, the pines. When I'd been ill and I'd got rid of my birds, and when I sort of got out of my health problems, I started to have, I had a, a small aviary so that I could have a bit of relaxation time after work. Um, when we moved house, my old baby fell apart, Michael built me an aviary that had got 24 breeding cages in it. Dad, everybody used to come to my house for Boxing Day, and Dad turned up and said, you're getting serious now, um, you're coming into the, into the partnership. Uh, what are we going to call, we call ourselves? I said, well, what do you mean, Dad? He said, I am not writing HF in the next P Holland on an entry form. It's too much. I said, well, what do you want? You've obviously worked something out. And he says, how about the Holland stud? That's what you want, that's what we'll call ourselves. So the day he passed away, I never told him there was more letters in the Holland stud than there was in SP, uh, HF M and SP Holland. He never knew that. Uh, <laughs> But that's, that's the main breeding room. Uh, so Michael has 35? I've got 35 pairs. 35 breeding pairs in that aggregate. Which leaves me 16 empty cages at the end. For store, youngsters and spare, spare birds. <clears throat> These are, this is what we've done in terms of the flights. Yeah. There used to be a wall across here that divided the internal flight and the external flights. What we were finding as birds developed was that you could throw a batch of babies into the, ex into the internal in into the flights. It was about 15 foot by 9 foot by 9 foot. And over the next week and a half, two weeks, you were fetching as many bird babies out as you put in. Basically, the leap from a, a small stop cage to that flight, those flights, was, was too much for them. So we, and the birds weren't using the external flights, so the wall came down, it all got filled in, and there's, in that room, there are four flights. Then, on the other side, there's another two flights where the external flight used to be. And then those are the two of the largest flights that we've got now. Um, that one, the one on the right hand side, is still sort of 15 foot long, but it's probably three and a half foot deep. Okay. Three and a half foot, four foot deep. Whereas the one on the left is a complete room that is uh, 12 foot by 7 foot. And the pizza that we work on is that the babies that come out of the stop cage go into the smallest of the flights. They can acclimatise, get a bit of strength around them, and then we move them on to the next one. As the next batch of babies come up, up away, they get moved up one and the, the babies take the small one. So the idea is we constantly stretch those birds. We constantly build muscle <coughs> in their wings so that they've gone from a two foot six square cage where they're breeding initially to a five foot flight, then a seven foot flight, then a nine foot flight, then up into the fifteen foot ones. And we use that same process with hens that we break up. We never take a hen out of the breeding cage and throw it into a big flight. And I that's firstly one. because yeah. the hen's breeding temperature at that point is elevated. You need to get that temperature down to a normal uh, body temperature. And what you've probably done as well is if you've taken two rounds off a hen, she's been in the confines of a nine square box 
for four months. So she has lost considerable amount of muscle in her wings. She cannot fly the same as she used to be able to fly to pair her up. So those enemies go back to the same process as the babies. They go into the stock cage where the temperature comes down, then that stock cage is going to the smaller flight, the smaller flight to the next size, to the next size before they get into the bigger flights. It's all a matter of trying to reduce any stress <coughs> or shock that those birds will have in the habilitation of, of getting flying properly. So this is the um, the old sail ship. Yeah. Uh, prior to the COVID outbreak, we were in the process of converting this. Then COVID broke out and it was left to Michael to, to finish it off by himself. We were literally, I go over to, I, I spend every Saturday with Michael um, and I think we were probably two weekends away from finishing it when lockdown started. So I, <laughs> it was sort of nine, ten months before I actually saw the finished article. <laughs> And that's what it's like inside. We, we went to Paul Stannard's and Michael fell in love with Paul's setup. Paul's got wire cages that are back to back. And Michael said, it's the closest I can imagine to being a controlled colony breeding system. Uh, so it was, unfortunately, the size of the hybrid we couldn't go back to back, it just didn't work. But we, there's, there's 30, I managed to get 30 second down wire cages. Uh, they're all set up in there. And our birds hate it. Yeah. Our birds hate them. Yeah, we're into the third breeding season in there. Uh, we're third breeding season? Yeah, third breeding season. And they're still struggling to get birds to go to nest in some of those cages. Uh, the initial time we paired up, I put 30, 30 new pairs into there, thinking everything was going to work beautifully. And out of the 30 pairs of birds that I consider to be in extremely good breeding condition, 17 pairs that went in the nest. What you've got to report, if, you if you go back on the store, right, I went over one Saturday and couldn't find, I've got keys, you know, like Michael. The house that Michael lived in was our family home. My sister, myself, my brother-in-law have got keys, we'll let ourselves in. I go up the garden, I know where Michael normally is, he's in the aviary cleaning on a Saturday. So I'm going around the aviary and I can't find Michael. I go, where the heck is he? And then I heard the sound coming from the old sail ship. So Potter's over there, what the heck are you doing over here? I've decided that all of those old hens that we bred in 2015 that we can't give away because they're three years old we can't sell because they're three years old they're coming over here into the nine cages and i want you to get me some steel cages to put on the other wall um coming over here with young bouncy cock birds and if i can convert them the old 2015 hens into one chick each, I'll be happy. So I managed to get some, white, uh, some metal cages, and if I was to say to you, if me and him were in there, it was like this. Uh, there was a hole in the, the far window where the fan used to be that blew a gale. It was like the slums in there. It put 21? 21 pairs down. There was 21 pairs down. And I've read 97 youngsters out of the 21 pairs. And the 2015, and the 2015 hens. So that convinced me the following year to do the same. So by then some of them hens were four years old. Four year old. All right, I replaced some with some other three year old, but I never used any Young hens one. that were younger than three year old. And I've read 127 youngsters out of the 21 cages the following year. So we which led on to the conversion. Bringing the songs up to the Ritz. It, it's, it's beautiful in there because it's all plastic line, it's all got new, new uh, lighting, new electrics, you name it, it had it. 
So when I put 30 pairs in there and 17 of them refused to go in a box, it was a bit of a kick <laughs> because they were quite happy to invest in the slums, but they wouldn't go in the Rolls Royce in the Ritz. And if you watch the look in there now, between every one of those wire cages now is a full length plastic divider. So I've turned all of those cages basically back into a box. So I, I, and they are now being used regularly as breeding cages. I, I so hate a phone call in the week from Michael because it normally means there's something wrong or there's some kind of panic or something like that. And I had a phone call off him when he started. And, and remember, this was during the COVID sort of lockdown period, so I have no idea what's going on half the time. Uh, when I collected seed from Michael, it was dumped on the doorstep, and we sort of stood from here to there away. And sort of, if we, we wanted to swap birds over, I'd pull up on the drive and phone him, and he'd bring up, you know, it was crazy times. And I had this phone call to say, the birds won't go in the nest box. He's like, great, they'll come in. But then a, a week or so later, he, he, the phone call came and I've sorted the problem out and what what have you done? Put plastic dividers. Well it wasn't plastic no, dividers. The initial one I put I've got a milling spray box and I cut the milling spray box up into pieces and slid them between each cage, piece of cardboard. But when I saw that that was all it took to get hens to go in the next boxes. The following year, we, we modified it. We've, we've now been to plastic sheets between the two. We've now been to three aviaries. Three aviaries. have got wire cages, and you sort of walk down and go, "Look at this! Every body has got, got the dividers, dividers between." Why is so anybody who's thinking about going down a wire cage route, you must accept that it isn't quite as easy to get birds used to them. What I am finding is that birds that were bred in them cages tend to breed better in them when they become adults. So there's, there's a change of a period from conventional cages to them. Some birds just go in, take the notice. They I mean within hours. Others, no, they just will not take to them at all. So that's, that's the main aviary. 28, no, that's 28 miles away, <laughs> that's my place. Um, my property is a, is a modern property. I haven't got a big back garden. I've got a lot of side garden. If some of the back side garden was in the back garden, they'd be very happy. Um, it's a brick built aviary. Um, what I would say to anybody, if you're thinking of building a brick built aviary, get in contact with your local council and just get a letter of approval. Um, there's 36 breeding cages in there and two small, well, there's one small flight and a mobile flight. The way we work it is once the, um, <coughs> once the flights are filled with babies, I will normally phone Michael on a Wednesday and say, Saturday I am bringing over X number of babies, make space. Um, because what that means is my next lot of babies are about to come away. So that's the way we do it. We do literally a rolling um, conveyor belt of, of babies from my place to his. Um, brick built, insulated, double glazed, um, slight of tile roof. It's, you know, it, and that's the, the second aviary on that site. Uh, Originally, when we moved in, Michael built a, um, an a wooden A before me, 24 breeding cages, and the one year I thought, either I am drunk or there is something desperately wrong with this aviary. Um, and when we took the, the panelling off the one wall, I'd got an ant's nest that was up here, mm -hmm. and every main beam in the place had been eaten away by the ants. So it was a case of what do we do to it? Um, we, took, we took the decision that we were going to go up to 35 and then it got down up to 36. If you look on the right hand side, the, I had conifers, Leyland, I can conifers hiding the house, and we needed to take out one conifer. Well, great, we managed to get it out, and Michael and I <coughs> were trying to get the root out. If you've ever tried to get a Leyland root out, good luck. 
my wife came out with a cup of tea for us and said, why don't we just carve something in it? You know, you never really get it out. And when we got it out, my wife and I could not lift it up. We couldn't lift it up. So I get it out, we? Couldn't, not. honestly, we couldn't lift it up. We, we've got acros, we've got acros pushing it backwards and forwards to, to try and find the route. I had to take 21 out. This is never again. Never again. In fact, the but you says, didn't either. Well, Simon, <laughs> Simon had to take 21 out, you mean? I took three weeks to get 15 out. Simon, Simon took yeah. half a dozen out in a month. My, my right. cage is mm -hmm. that floor height on the back wall. It was done deliberately to keep the footprint as small as we could. Um, Plastic nest boxes, and then I've got some hinges <coughs> on the side walls. Again, the, down, the downside of plastic nest boxes, as we've now learned, is, is that, that, that you get three to four chicks in there and they sweat considerably. The plastic nest boxes are teeming with water inside. The uh, only ventilation on yeah. the way down the side, it is a problem. I think the, we, the wooden nest boxes sweat, but the wood absorbs it. Yes. I don't think there's any difference. The wooden nest boxes sweat, but they absorb it. Whereas these, you can get you know, little running down. There's going back. Does anybody remember when we used to have the standard Doncaster? <laughs> you notice what Dad's got in his hand is a sandwich. <laughs> we never went out to shows, to judge, or anything. We had a cooked breakfast in the bag that Mum had made for us. <laughs> that was in the days when they had the stands. Yeah. 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 Now, put those in there to say, look at these birds. Come on, just put these on. 19, the one on the left hand side, 1981. The one in the middle, 1981. And wouldn't even we a, you know, 1995, 1986. Birds that today would be I think you'll find the one on the left hand side, the grey group. That one, the club Yeah. So you think that they wouldn't. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Would you want to start on the oddities or not? No. No, you want to go there. Young dark green cock last year. Uh, the bird that I like a lot. All right, we can see straight away the fault, the major fault it's got round with the flecking round on the top of its head. As a modern day budget, again, it's not a particularly good photo of him being. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't like being photo. Yeah. It's a real class bird, except for that one feature. Now, if, I've just repaired the same pair of birds that produced them. He was a one off. Um, the grey green cock to an alpine grey green hen. The dirt comes from the mother and at the alpine hen. I know where the, 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 the reflection comes from. Um, and there are two more looks in the box now. And this is where we were talking on the way down about the difference from one year to the next. The same pair of birds, the two youngsters they've got this year, are absolute garbage. They are mm. absolutely nothing like him. And you think to yourself, well, how does that happen from the same pair of birds? The advantage I've got is that particular dark green cock was probably paired was paired up as pair number two. He was paired to a cinnamon, a young cinnamon grey green egg initially. And I had a round clear eggs. Um, both the birds were quite young. So I put that down to um, the age, although he looked mature. Uh, and at this point I will say to anybody that is paired up, particularly with cock birds, they are sexually mature when they show a full iris. Full bright iris, right. not, not a milky coloured one, a so full that's, that's bright way white iris. That's the way cock bird is sexually mature. mature. It's got nothing to do with age, it's when the bird matures. 
Now, that bird I decided, as I do with most pairs of birds, to have a clear round of eggs, I break the pair. Very, very rarely do I let them go for the second round of uh, eggs, because normally what you get is another round of clear eggs. So I broke the initial pair up and I repaired him with another very good seal of light green head. And lo and behold, another round of clear eggs. <coughs> so at that point you think, do you take him out of the breeding team? And you think, well, oh, it's such a good bird that you need to maximise what you can get off him. So as I've done in the past with other birds, I've downgraded the hen that he was paired to. Quality the one. initial two hens he was paired to were high quality hens. Whereas the third hen he was paired to was a more modest, motherly type of hen that was well bred, but was not uh, in the same league visually as the initial two. And he's just, well, if, if I'd have been at home today, I would have taken the first two milks away from him. And he's just sitting on six fertile eggs now, the second round. My intention is as soon as those eggs start to hatch, is I will move him, and then I'll, I'll repair him, possibly with one of the two cinnamon eggs. Because I think then he is properly mature. He's a different bird in the cage, in his surroundings. He's grown into a breeding bird now. Uh, and I think if I repair him with one of the cinnamon ends, I'll probably get birds on the eggs now. What I would say, if Dad was still with us, that bird would have been the first bird out of the apron. Yeah. My dad would not have would, been That been bird would not have stayed with us. It had got two things wrong with it. A, he's a dark factor, yeah. and B, he's, he's got flicking. Dad would not have stood that at all. Yeah, that would have been an argument. Yeah, that there would have been, been a proper <laughs> argument. Uh, the bird on the, on the right, does anybody know what it is? Clear. Pardon? Clear. Oh, no. Nope. Nope. We've had it described as a recessive point. We've had it described as everything from the yeah. earth. This one that's molting out all the time. This, is, this bird started life as a normal, normal grey. grey. Yeah. It started out as a normal grey hen, and with every molt, she gets lighter and lighter. Well, and that's lighter. not very long ago we that bird. No, no, she's, she's still alive. I took a photograph of her yesterday. She's got two flights in either side. They're black. That's it. All the rest of them is white. Yeah. Everything else, and that yeah. is what? Well, that's purely because the melanin mm. that the bird normally produces has stopped that's working. Not, not. So every, every feather that she replaces, she just replaces it with white feather. This is the bird that gets lighter as it gets older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> that's it. That is it. That's a noun. That's the same bird. Oh. <laughs> it's. I've been told it's what they call a mottled pie. It's not a pie, mm -hmm. but that's the description that I give it. So, just that's that. Where are we going now? Here you go. We've well, seen two young birds that we read last year. And uh, um, the, the old boy, Carl Bull, I think, won the two seeds. Worcester. Worcester. She won the old boy, young, uh, young old boy, blue series. Yes, yeah, you're going to fall to modern trees, they've both got a little bit of flecking. Which is pretty unusual in our stud as a whole. You know, we are um, pretty ruthless when it comes to flecking. Um, for, the, for the newer chap, that's the grizzly bit in the top of there. It should be there. The, cap, the top of the chap, cap should be clear. Whether it be on a green bird, it would be yellow, or on a blue or grey bird, it should be white. Um, it's a major fault, but you have to learn to manage those faults. And both of them birds have got some other extremely desirable features. They've got to, those so have got to utilise those features. Those have got to be cousins, haven't they? Uh, she's out of the pie cock. Uh, no, she's out of the yellow face. No, she's out. She's out of the pie cock. She's in my place now, and she's absolutely evil. I'll tell you that, dear. She's evil. Yes. Yeah, you want to lose a finger, finger, put your finger in the next box. You'll lose a finger. You'll lose a finger. You'll lose a finger. You'll lose a hand. Now again, this is um, cinnamon, cinnamon blue cock. That um, again, when he's prepared, well, it's, he's a nice bird on the shelf, which is he's full of holes there, and obviously still covered in beetroot from when he's been feeding youngsters. 
Um, a lot of our cinnamon uh, revolve around one bird. <laughs> Um, and it's a bird that we bought. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it was a strange situation. There was a local champion breeder, small time champion breeder. Some, there were some of you will know him. Alan, Alan Blakeman. Yeah, he was, he was heavily involved with Birmingham. Oh, oh, we've um, known Blakey since we, yeah, we were and, kids. And I saw that the parents to that, the parent to that, uh, Cinnamon Squad Blue Cop. There's a six week old baby that he bred. And I asked him at that time, I said, next year after you've bred from it, could I buy that bird? And he said, yeah, no problem. Well, normally you never really hear from them again. Well, the following year, as good as gold, he rolled up and he said, I'll finish with the cinema bird, go and fetch him. And that is the background of pretty much all of our cinemas. Um, and he established that browniness over the eye, the lift above the eye. The big spots, it was, it was a quite uh, well, she's still alive. I've just took him out of the breeding cage now. I don't think we've got any more of him there. I think he's six years old now. Um, he never produced numbers. Numbers. He would always fill some eggs. He would fill the first <coughs> and the third and the fifth or the second and the third, and then that was it. Mm. You never ended up with a complete clutch of So each round you would end up with a nice chick. One or two subjects. But at the background of all of our cinnamons is, is that particular bird. So we, rather than being um, particularly heavy on line breeding, we do use quite a lot of outcross birds. And I think that maintains our vigour in the birds far more than some of the um, breeders that are constantly in breeding. Uh, we don't normally suffer with poor fertility, poor attributability. Uh, at the end of the day, we end up with chicks on the village. Guilty as charged. Oh. This is a lovely young cinnamon. He's a boy, isn't he? Yeah. That's, that's the grand that's the son at the old man. Yeah. He's got Three in the three, four in the nest box now, and I've already got three out of it. Mm -hmm. Very nice um, cinnamon cobalt out of it. Yeah. The cinnamon on the left. The cinnamon on the left. Uh, I've just again, I've just broken her up. She was, she's been there to uh, a really good uh, yellow face guy, Blue Cock, and there's five youngsters. And the five youngsters are particularly, particularly good. <coughs> now, this is, this is a situation where I much prefer the, the quality on the cock bird. And when I, when I say that, these are sort of well bred ordinary animals that do well in the breeding cage. And I like to pair those birds to extreme